Uh, well, good evening, everyone. So it's my pleasure this evening to welcome Professor Tallis, who has spoken to us before and uh, uh, and has entertained as well. And I look forward to this evening. He's uh, he, he's challenging my personal assumption and uh, also Lord Kelvin's assumption that uh, numbers are everything in, in understanding nature. But um, I look forward to uh, being proven wrong. Raymond. Oh, well, thank you very much indeed for having me back. I must say when Andreas wrote to me and invited me, my response of yes was so rapid, it was almost indecent. So thank you very much for having me back. We absolutely love Terry, my wife and I love being here in Bath. And Don, thank you for, uh, as it were, stepping up to the plate because poor Andreas uh, is not well and I, I, I very much miss uh, meeting him, but um, I'm very glad to be here. And as Don says, I, I, I'm hoping very much that what I say will be contradicted by at least some people in the audience. It's actually based on the 10th chapter of a book I'm in the process of writing. Uh, so I'm up for, as it were, correction. Um, but let's see, let's see how, how it goes. The topic, cutting measurement down to size. And by the way, I speak as somebody myself as a scientist. I was a neuroscientist. Uh, as a medic, uh, all, all of the advances in medicine uh, were, were based on science as we understood it, natural science. But I have a problem with the assumption that science is the only path to reality. And this is my the burden of my message tonight. Um, so I'm against physics as the last word on metaphysics, against physics as the last word on reality. Um, of course, physics is extraordinary. It has astounding predictive power. It, its applications vastly amplify our agency, and I'll give some illustrations of that. And the law, scope of its laws seem to be boundless, or at least uh, coterminous with the physical universe. I'm just going to move this a bit because I'm aware that when I move a little bit this way, I might lose those members of the audience that are on um, Zoom. But is, is that OK, Don? Am I all right if I sort of look a little bit this way? That's OK. Fine. So, yeah. yeah, super. Camera that you at, oh, good. Hello, camera. Hi. Yeah. Um, the astounding predictive power, both on the big stuff and on the small stuff. Let me give you an example of the small stuff. The prediction, on the one hand, and the subsequent measurement of the intrinsic properties of spin and charge of the electron give results that agree to 14 decimal places, not, 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 and so on and so forth. I mean, that's an extraordinary um, success. So that's the big story. What about, that's a little story, what about the big story? And here's a quote from uh, Frank Close's wonderful book on um, Peter Higgs of the Higgs boson. And I strongly recommend this book to you. It's called Elusive, because both the Higgs boson and Peter Higgs were rather elusive. But um, he points out that the inflationary theory, which is the predominant theory of the origin of the universe at present, says that the universe began as a hot spot of energy, a tiny seed, a hundred billionth of a billionth of the size of a proton, which then inflated exponentially by 26 powers of 10, in each of three spatial dimensions in 10 to the minus 32 seconds. That is, say, hundredth of a thousandth of a millionth of a billionth of a trillionth of a second. That's the kind of stuff that physics is delivering for us. And even, even if that was wrong, the precision of the error is absolutely gobsmacking, isn't it? Um, so astounding predictive power. And then, of course, something probably I don't need to spell out is that the applications that vastly amplify our agency as human beings. My wife and I are no good at reading maps. We're no good at finding a way around the world. We switch on Google Maps and suddenly the map is able to tell us exactly where we're going and even telling us when we're just 100 or 200 yards away from our target. For that map to work, a signal has to be sent from the thing in our car up to a satellite circling around the earth and bounce down with such a precision. And Don would have a better idea, I guess, of the kind of millionth of a millionth of a millionth of a seconds of arc that is necessary for that kind of precision. I can talk to somebody in Australia, precisely an individual in Australia, 
without raising my voice. Can you imagine saying that a hundred years ago? You know, you'd be helped out of the hall and people would be, you know, um, telling you, you know, it's pure fantasy. And already by 2000, 30% of GDP in the USA depended on inventions made possible by quantum mechanics. So clearly our agency has been massively expanded by physics. As John Wheeler, many of you, a name you'll be familiar with, said that quantum theory in an everyday context is unshakable, unchallengeable, undefeatable. It's battle-tested. Good. And then there's the scope of its laws. The laws of nature appear to be applicable throughout the universe. However, spoiler alert, I'm going to come back presently. Um, many scientists have been very dismissive of anything that philosophy might have to contribute to metaphysics. Physics is the answer to metaphysics. Some of you may recognize this character, Steven Weinberg, brilliant um, uh, physicist who discovered an electroweak force and so on and so forth. And in his book called Against Philosophy, or rather in the chapter in his book called Against Philosophy and Dreams of a Final Theory, he said, the insights of philosophers I studied seemed murky and inconsequential compared with the dazzling successes of mathematics and physics. Even where the insights of philosophers occasionally benefit physicists, this has been generally in a negative fa fashion by canceling the preconceptions of other philosophers. Ouch. And then everybody will be familiar with the wonderful Stephen Hawking's and towards the end of a brief history of time, which everybody bought and some people read, um, he said, philosophy is dead. Philosophy is not kept up with modern developments of science, especially physics. And some philosophers themselves are against the notion that philosophy has much to contribute to metaphysics. Here is one of the great philosophers of the 20th century, Hilary Putnam. And he said, I don't believe that there are any longer any philosophical problems about time. There are only the physical problems of determining the exact physical geometry of the four dimensional continuum we inhabit. I wasn't very happy about that. And this book I published a few years ago of Time and Lamentation devotes approximately 700 pages to showing exactly why basically the metaphysics of time cannot be derived from physics. In fact, my aim was to rescue time from the jaws of physics. Um, and then we have uh, Isaiah Berlin, um, who was talking about those philosophers at the beginning of the 20th century who, uh, who called themselves logical positivists. And the aim of logical positivism was, as Bernard Williams put it, to turn philosophy into the humble obituarist of metaphysics and the secretary to science. And then just to end up with a fairly recent example, James Lederman works down the road, brilliant philosopher, works in Bristol, professor of philosophy at Bristol. In his book, Everything Must Go, he said, any new metaphysical claim that's to be taken seriously should be motivated by and only by the service it would perform, if true, in showing how two or more specific scientific hypotheses join jointly explain more than the sum of what is explained by the two hypotheses taken separately, where a scientific hypothesis is understood as an hypothesis that's taken seriously by institutionally bona fide current science. And on the basis of that, he dismissed most philosophical metaphysics as neo-scholasticism. Oh, well, end of story, end of lecture. And now I'd like to ask for questions, but not so fast, not so fast. There are problems with physics as metaphysics. And here's, here are some of the headline problems. The incompatibility of general relativity and quantum mechanics. The dubious standing of elementary particles. What are they? The absurdity of string theory. The unintelligibility of quantum mechanics. And then there's something that's called the measurement problem, which I'll focus on in the second half of my talk. But let's talk about the incompatibility of the two greatest theories in physics at the moment. General relativity, we associate with Einstein, and quantum mechanics, we associate with Niels Bohr, Schrodinger, Heisenberg, Dirac, and others. Dirac, who, by the way, uh, was brought up down the road, as you know, in Bristol. 
So what is the problem of reconciling general relativity with quantum mechanics? Massive problems. The first problem is one that really exercised Einstein, which is the problem of entanglement. If you have two um, elementary particles, let's say electrons, basically if you do something to one electron, that determines what the other, if you make a measurement on one electron, it determines what the outcome of the measurement will be on the other electron. And the thing is, it doesn't matter how far those electrons are separated, that effect will be transmitted instantaneously. Ouch, that's faster than the speed of light, which is not permissible by general relativity. And then quantum mechanics is not able to cope with space and time. In fact, quantum mechanics actually threatens the very notions of space and time. Worse still is you have infinities in quantum mechanics that emerge when you try and apply general relativity to quantum mechanics. Infinities. Aristotle told us thousands of years ago, there are no real infinities. There are potential infinities, but no real infinities. So how, do, how does quantum mechanics cope with these ridiculous things called infinities? Well, that, by little fiddles called renormalization. And by the way, there's no place for gravity in quantum mechanics. Given that gravity is very much weaker, 10 to the power of 35, weaker than electromagnetic force, this can be overlooked. But actually, the fact remains, gravity is real. So you can already see that there are very serious problems of reconciling the two big theories in physics. They actually don't get on with each other at all. So really, we can't actually look to physics to say, hmm, this is how things really are, because there's this massive squabble between quantum mechanics and general relativity. And then there's this question of elementary particles. They used to be pretty straightforward things in the old days, didn't they? An atom was something that was atmos. That is to say, it couldn't be split. That's what it meant to the Greeks, Democritus and so on. That's what it meant subsequently. But Niels Bohr basically tore his hair out in lumps trying to make the sense of the basic elements of what is. He eventually concluded that everything we call real, like fundamental particles, is made of entities we can't call real, because those fundamental particles seem to evaporate the stronger your gaze. And one of the ways, the reasons he came to that conclusion was entities seem to have no definite or clear properties before they were measured. They had no definite position, for example, no definite uh, velocity, no definite existence. And by the way, what are these elementary particles or elementary Elements. Well, are they particles? Are they waves? Are they localized excitement in fields? Are they something which is a bit of a fiddle, a wave packet? That is to say, a wave that basically has a boundary to it. And the answer is, nobody quite knows. What a total mess. And in order to rescue that mess, in particular the one where there was an attempt to reconcile quantum mechanics with relativity theory, it was introduced in the early 70s, string theory, which has continued to struggle to make sense of itself in the subsequent 30, 40 years. String theory basically says there aren't four dimensions, three of space and one of time. There are 11 dimensions, but don't worry about that. Seven are rolled up and they'll always be inaccessible. And in fact, if you look at the theories that un are, can be unpacked, uh, from string theory, which is the notion that fundamental elements are just simply vibrating one-dimensional strings, you get a landscape of 10 to the power of 5,012 theories. And those theories, what's more, are untestable or present or in the foreseeable future. Ultimately, people's patience with string theory eventually broke. And George Ellis, Ellis, who was a very serious physicist, and Joe Silk wrote a very famous paper in Nature in 2014. Scientific method, he said, defend the integrity of physics. And what they really re re resented was the fact that string theory was not testable. There was no observable consequences of string theory that could enable you to test 
whether it was true or false. It was just a way of dealing with mathematical embarrassments. And then, of course, we've got quantum mechanics. If we look at it by itself, it actually doesn't make sense. Don't take my word for it. Richard Feynman, many of you will be familiar with his name, one of the great physicists of the 20th century. And he said, anyone who thinks they understand quantum mechanics, quantum physics, doesn't understand quantum physics. And John Horgan, a very good um, uh, popularizer of uh, physics in a recent article, said that quantum mechanics is a black box. From it, we get extraordinarily precise predictions. But we have no idea what happens in the black box. So suddenly, it's not looking so good for physics as a kind of explanation of what fundamentally is. And then there pops up something called the measurement problem which some of you may be familiar with. What's the measurement problem? Well, in quantum mechanics, you have the notion of a wave function, basically that evolves deterministically as a linear, in a linear way. But at any given moment, the different states of the system that you're interested in are superposed. So at any given time, there are lots of superposed values. But when you make a measurement, you always find the system in a definite, determinate state. This is so-called decoherence or collapse. And it's totally obscure how the superposition of different values becomes a single value. And what I want to argue in this second half of the lecture is that the measurement problem is located in the strange and problematic nature of measurement. One root of the problem is a result of over overlooking the unnatural nature of measurement. And by the way, there is another source of the measurement problem. It's the result of thinking that reality is best defined quantitatively. That what is fundamentally is boils down to how much. That how much itself unpacks to how many. That numbers ultimately are the last word on what is. And now we begin with, uh, we uh, engage with one of Don's heroes, uh, Lord Kelvin, like Don from Glasgow, who is a prophet, prophet of what you might call the worship or the apotheosis of measurement. And here's a very famous quote from a lecture he gave in 1889. When you can measure what you're speaking about, he said, you know something about it. But when you can't measure it, when you can't express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meager and unsatisfactory kind. It may be the beginning of knowledge, but you've scarcely in your thoughts advanced to the stage of science. This, behind this is the belief that quantity reveals reality, that what is, is how much or how many. And that leads for some to the notion that reality is ultimately mathematical, even that reality is a mathematical structure. So we need to put measurement in its place. And one way of doing that is exposed is, is by exposing what's lost, lost when you make a measurement and reminding ourselves also how measurement doesn't belong to the natural world. It's a very unnatural thing. It is, as I say, not part of the natural world, not part of the world that science describes. Measurement is something that is so peculiar, it should embarrass science. So let's look at um, what happens uh, when we make a measurement. What's lost in the passage to quantity? What's lost when we make entities or beings as mere bearers of parameters like space, sorry, like length, mass, or time? One of the consequences is there's an erasure of difference that results when you have quantitative, quantitative equations. The world is homogenized. All the fundamental differences between things are lost. And that's what leads to the fantasy of what is as a mathematical structure. So we reduce entities to parameters, and we abolish something called secondary qualities. They're not terribly secondary, but there are things like the feeling of warmth, the look of color, shininess, all of that disappears. Uh, when you um, make measurements. 
And in fact, what also disappears are primary qualities, as we have seen. But the important thing is that when you have records, when you have data, when you have records of observations, you lose the phenomenal appearance of things. Let's start with something pretty homely. Measuring a table. So there's your table. Let's measure it. What do we do when we measure it? Well, we extract from it its length and its width. When we get the answer to that, the table has ceased to have a location. So I tell you the table is four feet by six feet, but unlike a table I'm observing, it's not over there, it's not over here, it's not anywhere at all. And by the way, it has no color or other experienceable features. Color in the world of measurement just simply uh, boils down to different wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation, which is totally different from color. In short, the table loses all its phenomenal content, its phenomenal appearance. It is de-phenomenalized. So that's the first partner in the measurement. So what's, what, what do we use to measure the size of the table? Well, we use one of these devices. That's not an advert. It's just one that you know anybody can use any time. And this partner in the measurement also is de-phenomenalized because that tape measure is reduced simply to one parameter, its length. Likewise, when I report that the table is four feet by six feet, that measuring device has no position. And by the way, the color of the tape, color of the numbers on it are all irrelevant. Indeed, the tape measure is absent. But actually, there are four parties when you make a measurement. There's the measured, me measured object, there's the measuring device, and then, by the way, there's somebody who does the measurement who appears to have disappeared when I say the table is four by six. But four by six of what? So we have another party to the measurement, which is called the unit. The unit is central to the passage from how much to how many, the journey to poor numbers, pure numbers. Actually, units began in a funny place. They began in our bodies, inches, actually, were the size of the thumb. Feet were the size of the feet. Fathoms were the span of outstretched arms. Cubits were the forearm. And miles were miles for talking about the distances Roman soldiers could walk in a particular time. What a strange, what a strange thing to do, to use one's body as a primordial unit of measurement. You stand outside of your body, you make your body as anybody's body. You actually assert a kind of democracy between my bodies and other bodies, between this object I'm measuring and this body of mine that is the measuring device. But units have proved, moved on since then, so I'm using our body. And this is Max Born, some of you will be familiar with his name, 1926. He was the father of the Born rule, which I will return to in due course. But in his wonderful book on Einstein, he begins by defining what a unit is. He says the foundation of every space and time measurement is laid down by fixing the unit. Remember the unit is the way we move from basically how much to how many. The phrase a length of so many, uh, so and so meters denotes the ratio of the length to be measured to the length of a meter. The phrase a time of so many seconds denotes the ratio of the time to be measured to the duration of a second. So we're, as he says, we're always dealing with ratios, relative data concerning units, which are themselves to a high degree of art, high degree arbitrary, and they have nothing to do with the nature of the thing that is being measured. And just how far we move from the nature of thing being measured is illustrated by this example. This is Le Grand K the kilogram that was curated in Paris for 150 years, which was the um, reference point for the measure of a kilogram. And they discovered that, you know, it was losing 0.0001% of its stuff. Uh, and they decided we could no longer rely on the kilogram as our unit of measurement, our final reference point. And in, I think, 2017, they decided they would go replace the bar of metal in Paris by a definition 
rather distantly related to any perceptual entity. And the definition, by the way, is Planck's constant, 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. We've gone an awful long way from a table. We've gone an awful long way from the human body. We've gone a long way from the world. But reduction of units makes all entities citizens of nowhere. But it makes everything the same. Atoms, mountains, ships and shoes and sealing wax and cabbages and the mem members in front of me of the Bath RSLI are through the ideas of me our eyes of measurement homogenized. So units transform the how much into a pure number, how many. It completes the passage from what is to number. And it's pretty cheeky, actually. It's same units for the weight of a person and for the weight of the feces they may have passed during the day. I don't know about you, but I think I'm fundamentally different from the feces I pass in the day, but you know that's confidential. So units clearly, as it were, strip off the distinctive essence of individual things. Of course, there is a kind of game. We seem to sort of take the side of objects. We get ourselves out of the way. We have a basis for agreement. You may think the table's big and I may think it's small, but sooner or later we're going to have to agree it's four by six. But we lose the subjective and also seemingly the subject. The measurement bears no mark of the actor who made the measure. We have the dephenomenization, as I said. We drain out secondary qualities, colors, and so on. And in fact, we drain primary qualities. Numbers of units give no idea of the kind of size that things have. Take this beach. What is, how, how many is this beach? Well, it's one beach. Well, it's a billion sand grains. It's a trillion, trillion, trillion molecules of silica or it's a trillion kilograms, or it's a trillion, trillion micrograms. So you can see how little numbers arising out of the application of units to things give us of even of the size of things. And that's before we start adding up and averaging observations of data, connecting types of data. Before we get to the things that are central to physical science, which are, of course, equations. That's where we suddenly basically cross-unitize what we have seen when the number is preserved. And let me illustrate this. Everybody, be, I guess, would be familiar with this equation. E equals mc squared. On the left, E equals energy. On the right, m equals mass. Now, you'd think, at least give us two things in the world, energy and mass but suddenly they're made equivalent. And how are they made equivalent? Oh, by the way, we multiply mass by the speed of life, light extracted from light, and there's nothing light about the speed of light, extracted from light, and then cheekily we multiply it by itself. Can you think of what sort of thing, you, what, what, how is that a way to treat light? But suddenly we have essentially a portrait of the universe e equals mc squared, which tells us absolutely nothing about the universe. Because everything is either mass or energy, but this final difference between mass and energy is lost in an ultimate act of homogenization. And as I say, light is present as its abstracted velocity multiplied by itself. It's a nearly blank portrait of the world. And you can see already how far we've gone from the rich variety and reality of the world in which we pass our lives. Thank you very much indeed for E equal MC squared. It gave us nuclear power. Alas, it gave us nuclear bombs as well. But apart from that little blip, it has contributed enormously to our well-being. But it is not a portrait of the world, even less a metaphysical account of the world. But in equations, different stuffs like energy and matter bury their differences in numerical equivalence. And so we move towards a theory of everything. Apart from that awkward business of quantum mechanics not agreeing with uh, general relativity. A theory of everything. But as you can see, that theory of everything looks more like a theory of nothing in particular. Perhaps a theory of nothing at all. So here we are. We have a dephenomenalization of experience. Observation as the extraction of parameters. 
parameters quantified according to absent units, kilogram in Paris, Planck constant or whatever, the irrelevance of the physical appearance of results. And then we do things like averaging, graphing, sum totaling, repetition and test repeatability. And slowly but surely, the world is exsanguinated. There's then the idea that measurement is really on the side of the object. We get ourselves out of the way. So surely measurement is giving us what the fundamental reality of what is, is. But actually, and this brings us back to the measurement problem, the subject is present as the individual representative of the collective of subjects that is scientific constants. So when somebody takes the train to CERN, they are there representing a collective consciousness of science. Somebody there has to be conscious in order for an observation to be made. So even though we seem to have, as it were, scraped up the subject from the object, the fact remains there is still an interaction between a subject and an object. So the science that reveals what is isn't entirely without contamination from the process of re revealing what is. And a good example of this is there is not a natural transition from time, which we believe is part of the metaphysical reality of the universe, to something called timing. This is interestingly ignored by Carlo Rebelli, and I recommend Helgeland for you because it's got two virtues. One of it is beautifully written, and the other is it has lots of mistakes, and there's no greater joy than reading a book that's beautifully written that has lots of mistakes in it, because you can then say, gotcha, 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 but it's still beautifully written. But he says, in quantum physics parlance, an observer can be a detector, a screen, or even a stone, anything affected by a process. It doesn't need to be conscious or human or living or any of the sort. Well, here's somebody who you'll recognize would disagree with that profoundly. And I have to say, I'm on the side with the gentleman who's got more hair than I have. And this is something very interesting from a, some late autobiographical notes that Einstein published in 1949. He's talking about the general theory of relativity. One is struck, he said, by the fact that the theory of relativity introduces two kinds of physical things, measuring rods and clocks, and all other things, the electromagnetic field, the material point, etc. This, in a certain sense, is inconsistent. Strictly speaking, measuring rods and clocks would have to be represented as solutions of the basic equations, objects consisting of moving atom com atomic configurations, not as it were, theoretically self-sufficient entities. But he can't put back measuring rods and clocks into his general theory. They stick out the things that make the theory possible, the things that make the observations possible uh, that upon which the theory was based. Tim Maudley, a contemporary philosopher of physics, has put this nicely as well. Nature, he says, doesn't have to settle whether a given mechanism counts as a clock in order to determine how it should behave. But a term like a clock, unlike a light ray or a massive particle or a burst of energy, cannot appear in the statement of any fundamental law. In other words, what we do when we make measurements doesn't fit into the natural world we're trying to reveal through our measurements. Though, so those are entities such as clocks and those actions such as timing essential to physics, cannot be accommodated by physical science. Science based on measurement cannot be accounted for by science based on measurement. So scientific measurement leads to a world picture that has no contents. We saw the blank sheet that was E equals MC squared. And what's more, it cannot accommodate itself. Measurement cannot accommodate that there is a world picture. And here's somebody you'll be familiar with, not only a brilliant physicist, but also a remarkable philosopher of physics. Wonderful book, 1944, strongly recommend to it. It's been republished many times by Cambridge University Press. What is life? A moderately satisfying picture of the world has only been reached at the high price of taking ourselves out of the picture, stepping back into the role of the non-concerned observer. 
while the stuff from which our world picture is built is yielded exclusively from the sense organs as organs of the mind. Yet the conscious mind itself remains a stranger within that construct. It has no living space in it. So let me end up by asking, how does the problematic unnatural nature of measurement contact connect with the measurement problem in quantum mechanics? Some of you may be familiar with this, the Schrodinger wave equation. It's a, a wave that unfolds and essentially it's a portrait of the distribution of probabilities of outcomes of measurements. It evolves, as I say, deterministically as a linear superposition of different states. At, at any given time, before a measurement is made, an electron could be positive or negative spin. A electron can have a particular position or um, can have a range of positions rather, or a range of velocities, none of those until a measurement has been made. And the Born rule, you have saw Max Born before, sets out the probability that a measurement of a quantum system will yield a given result. So that's the probabilities, a range of possibilities. But actual measurement always finds the system in a definite determinate state. So how do we explain that? This is the one that caused physicists to scratch their head now for nearly, well, pretty well a century. How does a superposition of different values become a single value? Well, the source of the measurement problem is overlooking the role of the subject in measurement, overlooking the role of the subject in translating unpredictability and uncertainty into, cert uh, 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 translating unpredictability into uncertainty, into superposition. And that's the result of making a thing out of the wave function, when the wave function is all about the observer's uncertainty. That's what it's about. It's not a real entity in the world. It's a portrait of uncertainty presented as a distribution of possibilities. There is neither uncertainty nor possibility nor probability in the natural world in the absence of subjects. So the measurement probability arise through overlooking the problem of measurement and taking the number that results in the measurement too seriously as the definitive count of what is. The reward for making this connection is you don't have to invoke Niels Bohr's idealism when he says that reality is made up of things that are unreal, that fundamental entities don't have definite properties or even exist until they're observed. No. This is something that's come out of the fact that we've overlooked the process by which we've made measurement. And this is true also of the entanglement that I talked about at the beginning of the talk. We needn't explain, as it were, the seem to be faster than the light transmission between um, uh, particles. There's no need to claim that the superimposed values that Schrodinger talked about are retained after measurement and suggested that some people have, that all the re results are still there, but all but one are exiled to parallel universes created to house them. So these are some of the consequences of overrating measurement, regarding what is as ultimately how much, thinking that the world is ultimately mathematical, over each quantification, believing that quantitative physics is the final authority on metaphysics. Of course, the power of science is unquestionable. Its metaphysical authority is deeply questionable. We need to cut measurement down to size. Having said that, thank you, science, for greater life expectancy, health expectancy, food and water expectancy, fun expectancy, and for widening our intellectual horizon. So thank you, Don. I rest my case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ray. That was uh, a challenging talk, and uh, I acknowledge also that you said you welcome being challenged, so we'll have a chance to do that in a moment. I'd just like to say to those online that if you would like to put questions into the chat function, then uh, we'll try to give time to those as well. So starting in the room...
that's reductionism. Oh, sorry. Are, are you against, in principle, the, the idea of reduc reductionism in, in explaining the world? So the question was, am I against the principle of reductionism as a source of explanation? Well, it can explain certain things. I'm against the notion of reductionism as leaving, as it were, the whole of reality in place. I mean, you can't both reduce something and also treat it justly. So in a sense, that table, yes, it is usefully reduced to four by six. And I could say to you, I've got an object that's four by, four by six, and I've got a gap that's four by seven. Will the table, sorry, will this object go through? And you can say, absolutely it would. But I don't think I've learned anything about either object. So reductionism is extraordinarily useful as a way of ultimately helping us to manipulate things, but it isn't, doesn't do justice to things. And in fact, the word, very word reductionism, in a sense, betrays that, doesn't it? Thank you very much, Professor Tallis. As always, your talks are um, interesting, controversial, and, and immaculately prepared, and much enjoyed. I'd like to go back to that problem you have with the table. I, I know you went on a lot beyond that. There are hundreds of things you can measure about that table, not just its width and its height and its length, but its thickness. Um, you can measure the surface, how hard it is, how shiny it is, how much it reflects light. You can measure its thermal capacity, its insulation. That'll give you some idea of how it feel if you touch it and work on it, uh, possibly even its resonant frequency, which may even mean that actually if you measured it really accurately, you'd find it didn't have an exact measurement, but that measurement did actually move slightly all the time if there was mm. something causing it to resonate. So I think you vastly oversimplified that whole case. And, and you talked about secondary properties such as colour. Well, I'm not sure they are secondary properties. Uh, they can be defined. And, and I think that irrelevant, you know, irrespective of what you went on to say later, I think you use that argument as a turning point. And I think I'm afraid that was a very weak argument, that, that measurement of the tape. Well, thank you for that. I mean, it's given me a chance to unpack a bit further. Of course, a table, nobody pretends when we make a measure of the length and the width of a table, we're, cap we're capturing the table. There is an unlimited number of parameters we can measure in relation to the table. But even if we multiply the parameters endlessly, we never get back to the table. In other words, we could indeed do density, uh, all, the, all the things you measured, but it didn't, as it were, restore the table because none of those would have a location. Those figures that we get out of uh, the measurements wouldn't have, e.g., a location. Your point about secondary qualities is, I think, a really interesting one. My own feeling is, and it's a very long-standing belief going all the way back to Democritus, but particularly emphasized by Galileo and John Locke and so on, is that secondary qualities are not captured by quantity. So, for example, the difference between red and blue is the difference between electro electromagnetic radiation of different frequencies. But those two numerical differences don't in any way capture the experience of the difference between red and blue. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to put forward um, the perspective for subjective experience and consciousness. And I was thinking about the haiku by Vashu, and it is, Old pond, frog jumps in, sound of water. Uh, this to me seems very much connected with the idea of things being sensate. Uh, and it seems that uh, the spectacular success of physics with theoretical physics, physicists nearly represent a kind of church of a way of understanding the world is that there's not, not one uh, approach to the nature of consciousness, mm. Part particularly subjective experience. Now, I tend to believe that subjective experience, private thought, have a reality, mm. the, the tricky word reality, uh, again. 
So I would say, since I think you might be viewing things in that way of the value of subjective experience, how would you explain the great investment in avoiding that? That's interesting indeed. I mean, uh, first of all, I completely agree with you. And just to pick up on, on what the gentleman said before, I mean, sounds are a supreme example of something that has a subjective content, which is not captured by any kind of quantitative uh, um, measure. You know, wavelengths of sound, et cetera, et cetera, doesn't in any way begin to join, to relate to the, uh, con the con consciousness of hearing and so on. I mean, it, it is interesting, isn't it, why there is a desire to marginalize uh, subjective experience. And it's because it's led us into all sorts of messy places. You know, we need in certain circumstances to marginalize subjective experience. If you think the table's big and I think the table's small, why don't we just measure? And you'll see, we both agree it's four foot by six foot, end of story. So in a way, we seem to then be on the side of the object and we can genuinely, ob genu genuinely ob objective. That is, I guess, why we, as it were, have the church, I think is your phrase, of, of, of the quantitative world, because it's delivered so much. It's delivered so much agreement. But in the end, it has led to a world that's exsanguinated and, and de 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 phenomenalized. Yeah. Or a picture of the world, I should say. Yeah. I must agree. Thank you very much for an excellent talk, which I perhaps Thank you. understood <laughs> a tiny part of. But um, I'd like your thoughts as a neuroscientist. Now this very topical today with yet another gene sequence being revealed or claimed to be the cure for, the, uh, you know, a way on the cure to Alzheimer's. This absolute fascination with measurement in modern healthcare. And also I see now with the advent of AI, it's becoming even worse now and quantum computing is being hailed as a the future for medicine. And I just don't see it that way. I'm thinking you must have similar thoughts. I, I feel a bit ambivalent. I mean, thank you for that really good question. For example, I have no doubt it will be quite useful to identify as someone has suggested today that uh, there are two genes which predict quite accurately whether or not you're likely to have Alzheimer's disease. And you may say, in that case, we must be our brains. And my feeling is the brain in a certain condition is a necessary condition of our having ordinary function of everyday consciousness, but it isn't a sufficient condition. You cannot, from the brain, explain the intentionality of consciousness, the fact it's about things. So having said that, I think I've still got a challenge to meet. So, but, but I'm very grateful for the medicine that I did in the 40 years when I was a doctor, that a lot of it was quantitative. You know, people did do double blind control trials to see whether this lowered the blood pressure and whether lowering the blood pressure stopped having strokes and heart attacks and so on. Thank you very much indeed. It's great science. And that's why in the end, I sort of thanked science, but I don't for a moment think that understanding the nature of Alzheimer's disease or the causes that lead to it in any way account or, or explain what it is to be a human being, what it is to have normal mental function, what it is to have everyday life and so on. There's much more beyond what can be observed by looking at the brain or by quantitative measurements um, uh, in, in what we are. Yeah. So I, I feel ambivalent to some extent. You know, Thank you, science. Thank you, quantities. Thank you for all the treatments I was able to give my patients, which seemed to basically make them better rather than kill them. Um, so I thought. Uh, so in, in, in that sense, there's, I've, I've got unfinished business there. Yeah. Uh, thank you for talking. It was uh, provocative, certainly. Um, I'm sort of puzzled, really. I can see... The problems you know, that there are at the, um, at the subatomic level in terms of trying to understand quantum mechanics and the measurement problem. <clears throat> but what, I think you're sort of tarring the whole world with that problem, assuming you can extend it you know, uh, to being a more generic problem. Uh, look at astronomy, which I'm most familiar with. Um, astronomy is an area where measurement has served wonderful things in terms of enabling us to understand <clears throat> where the universe works. 
So we learned in the 19th century to do, um, uh, I understand parallax well enough to, to discover how far away stars were. And this century, more recently, we've got to the point where we can differentiate the light coming from stars to detect there are planets going around them. Um, Still more recently, we managed to see the way that space has expanded and contracted as gravity waves go by. So we have a huge new science yeah. um, that's produced by this means. Now, this is, of course, at the large level, not the small level, but this is where numbers really work. And these tiny di differences, tiny differences in terms of the actual length of a four kilometer array on LIGO, are telling us fantastic things. It's a wonderful thing. So measurement is actually what drives so much of our expansion of knowledge. That's the scientific point. On the, on the practical point, lots of measure things all the time, but it's just practical things. It's a small part of your life. I mean, it's useful to me that I can use a plug that I have, which has been bought and measured and, 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 and designed here, and take it to another country and fit it in their socket. And someone's done the measuring to make sure it works. It's a practical thing. It's, it's not, not a religion. It's simply a useful thing that makes life more healthy. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm, I hope I've bracketed my talk by saying that, in a sense. I began by saying, my God, look what science can do with measurement at the microscopic scale and at the macroscopic scale. And at the end, I thank science for all delivered. But it's, it, it's, it's the question of whether or not science has rendered metaphysical philosophy, the kind of conceptual analysis, the kind of thinking that philosophers do, has rendered it absolutely superfluous. And I don't feel it has. I think there are whole fundamental problems but all of the things you say, my God, you know, what would I do without measurement? Make a phone call to Australia? Absolutely not. So all of those things, it is, when it comes to expanding our agency, when it comes to making predictions, yeah. But when it comes to getting at the essence of things, what is, what is a human being, how those relate to the material objects that are our bodies and so on, I don't necessarily think that measurement will take us much further. But, as I say, I can't thank it science enough for what it's done for me and what it did for me as a professional. Yeah. Yeah. I have, uh, the questions are quite slow coming in online, but we do have one from uh, Jeremy Com Comerford. <clears throat> Is there a distinction to be drawn in physics or economics between theory of value in formal mathematical terms and the measurement of value in, in the real world? Well, I think that's a good question. I mean, clearly, if we're talking about mathematical value, we're talking about quantity or the relationships between quantities. If we're talking about value in everyday life, we're talking about things that we value, the normative things. And clearly, there is a huge distance between those two uh, understandings of quantitative value on the one hand and normative value on the other. Yeah. And another question which has just come in, is this problem relevant to the conundrum of trying to understand consciousness? <laughs> oh, thank you for that question. I mean, basically, I have a huge problem. All my research has been in neuroscience. And so I've been inside the brain, you know, all my life. And I'm still unable to see how what happens in the brain, basically, ionic currents passing through neurons and so on, have any relationship to my sense of being in the world here, addressing you and being aware of you and so on. And I, I feel this, this, this is a, a huge problem. And I think it's serious unfinished business. And if you want to know my metaphysical position, I'd like to say I'm a metaphysical mess. But I don't think it's all been sorted by quantitative science. So unless we can recognize we're in a metaphysical mess, we won't make progress. Yeah. Can I return to your table? So you implied that by measuring the length and width of a table, it lost its property of location. But location is like sort of any other measurement. It's, it's relative. So by measuring the table, you know that the bottom left-hand corner is a certain distance away from the top right-hand corner. And if you take your point of reference, the bottom left-hand corner of the room, you can tell where bits of the table are relative to that. So I don't see how measuring the length and width of anything makes the uh, location disappear. There's no such thing as the centre of a table as such. Yeah, yeah, good question. I mean, basically, um, I'm in communication with somebody and they say, well, look, send me the details about your table. 
and I'll tell you whether or not uh, we've got one in the, or, or the table you want. And I'll tell you the, whether we've got one in the shop. And I write and say, uh, I, I, the table I want is four feet by six feet. And the person would say, well, yes, but where is it? Um, <clears throat> a supplementary question that's come in, uh, which I, I don't understand. What do you make of the philosophy of Ian McGilchrist? I'm not familiar with this gentleman, but right. perhaps you are, Ray. Oh, my gosh. That's a sort of un underarm bowling, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, basically, Ian McGilchrist, uh, who is a lovely man. He and I have had many debates. But essentially, he has argued over many very fat books. I know how fat they are because I've reviewed them. Essentially, uh, that the uh, we have a big problem which is the dominance of our left hemispheres over our right hemispheres. The left hemispheres are linear, narrow, uh, logical, and are rather cut off from the world around them. And our right hemispheres are open to uh, what's going on elsewhere. And he says our problems essentially are due to the fact there is increasing dominance of the left here hemisphere over the right hemisphere. The first book in which he wrote that had 585 references. And I thought, hmm, that looks pretty left hemisphere to me. And then I teased in when I, I, I meet him, I say, so from what hemisphere are you, as it were, allocating the separate roles of the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere? You must have a third hemisphere, which tells you with the right left hemisphere it's gone wrong and the right hemisphere is what we should resort, resort to. So I'm sorry he basically is a good example of neuromythology that he spreads to include the evolution of the psyche, the evolution of society, and the evolution of history. And I'm not, I love neuroscience. I did it all my life, but I don't believe it actually has much to say about those kinds of things. Yeah. Okay, well, I think if we're, if we're running out of questions, uh... I put my, my own order in a little bit. Um, I think uh, everything you've said this evening has been true to a large extent. And I did promise that I'd be open-minded to changing my mind. But uh, I think the essence is that that we need the qualitative and we need the quantitative as well. Uh, we can't get away from that. Um, there was a wonderful man called David Mackay who was an advisor to the government on on the environment and things of that nature. And he received various suggestions. And one was that uh, the motorway verges should be cultivated to produce uh, crops to, to fuel the cars, to produce biofuel. And uh, he applied numbers to this uh, suggestion and decided that uh, in order to, to fuel the cars on a motorway, you would need verges about 50 kilometers wide on each side. Yes. So, so numbers can make a big difference to the the qualitative suggestion. Oh, of course, of course. And Go, yeah. of course, if you ever get on an airplane, you you should be grateful that the aeronautical engineers are using numbers rather than than uh, sort of qualitative suggestions. If the if the the wings are made by out of material which the man in the shop says looks really good and strong. Um, that's not quite good enough. No, it's it's very much tested numerically, and uh, and a good thing too. I couldn't agree with you more. Absolutely, but, yeah. but of course, numbers can be used to excess. So, I've changed my mind just a little bit. So, I'd like to you to join with me in thanking Professor Tellers for giving us a very interesting.